KCAL 9, voted America's best local news. It's 10 o'clock. Time for all today's late-breaking news and a look ahead at tomorrow. KCAL 9 News, 10 o'clock report. I just heard boom, boom, helicopter flying around. I came out the house to see what was going on. Bullets fly in the middle of a busy day on the streets of Los Angeles, a wild shootout that left two suspects dead. And tonight we're learning more about a kidnapping scheme that evidently went wrong. Good evening. You never know what's going to happen next on the streets of Los Angeles. And today, a deadly shootout with passersby diving for cover. Police shot it out with two suspected kidnappers they thought were picking up some ransom money. It happened at the corner of Compton and Gage. And our Angie Crouch is live on the scene tonight with the very latest. Angie? Well, R.D. and David, investigators are still on the scene here tonight, more than eight hours after police shot two kidnapping suspects here. The red van that they were shot in is uh, riddled with bullets. It's still out here tonight. Uh, the suspect's bodies were removed from the van just about an hour ago. Now police are gathering the final pieces of evidence from here at the scene. You can see again that uh, we're live in Florence. Police are still at the scene, and the bodies were removed just about one hour ago. Shortly before 9 o'clock tonight, coroners removed the bodies of two suspected kidnappers. The two were killed inside this red van during a spectacular shootout with L.A. police this afternoon. L.A. police say the two men were suspected of kidnapping a 29-year-old Hispanic man from this Mexican restaurant on 7th Street near downtown L.A. No, yo no me vi cuando... Waitress Susana Galaviz says the man who was kidnapped is 29-year-old Pablo Vasquez of Lincoln Heights, although police haven't confirmed the victim's identity. Galaviz says Vasquez is a cook at the restaurant, which is owned by his girlfriend. Galaviz says that Vasquez was sitting at the counter eating Sunday night around 10 when a Latino man walked in, tapped Vasquez on the shoulder, put a gun to his side and said, we're looking for you, come with me. Police say the kidnappers later demanded $300,000 ransom for the safe return of Vasquez. Family friends uh, that have some money, uh, uh, maybe not the kind of money that was being requested, uh, and uh, the amount of uh, ransom was negotiated down significantly. We're not saying uh, how much, however. Police say the victim's family delivered some of the money yesterday, then went with police to deliver the rest today. When the suspects showed up, the shooting began. Ultimately, the suspects came up with weapons, pointed and fired, at the officers from this department that were conducting the surveillance uh, at the time and to, who were attempting to arrest them. Officers uh, returned fire and two suspects are deceased uh, here at the scene. You know, I just heard boom, boom, helicopter flying around. I came out the house to see what was going on. Police say around the same time, the victim was found safe at a South Central home with three other suspects who were also arrested. The victim, the victim. Uh, was recovered uh, where we made an arrest at a house locally. He was in the custody of the three suspects at the time. Uh, and, and his life had been threatened. Uh, the good work of the surveillance unit probably saved his life. Among those investigating the crime scene today, some familiar faces from the O.J. Simpson trial. L.A. police detective Tom Lang and criminalist Dennis Fung. And we're back live now in Florence. Investigators are still gathering evidence from inside that red van. Police say they should be wrapped up here in about an hour in this intersection can be reopened. That's the very latest from Florence. I'm Angie Crouch reporting live. R.D. and David, back to you. Angie, I, I saw one report earlier today that some of the officers involved in, the, in investigating this case were members of a unit that targets career criminals. Do you know anything more about that? That's right. This is a specialized unit, and that is one of the things that they do specialize in, whether or not these people that were shot here today are, in fact, career criminals. We just don't know enough about their background yet. So these are a lot of the questions that are going to be answered in the coming days. All right, Angie. Thank you. Well, it's a jail that has seen more than its share of troubles, but nothing quite this bad. What erupted today at the Peter J. Pitches Detention Center can only be described as chaos. More than 2,000 inmates were involved in a series of brawls that sent more than two dozen prisoners to the hospital. The detention center is located in Saugus, 25 miles north of Los Angeles. Tony Ginyard is standing by live in Saugus with the latest on that. Tony? Well, David and R.D., I hesitate to say that everything is quiet here because every time you turn around, something else happens. During a four-and-a-half-hour period today, there have been four different fights involving some 2,300 inmates. The first one started at 2 o'clock this afternoon. The last one happened at 6.30 tonight. The latest disturbance at the Peter Pitches Detention Center marks the third time this year violence has erupted among inmates. 
The first of four incidents on this day began with fighting in four dorms of the jail's east wing. By the time sheriff's deputies grabbed their emergency response gear, that fight had spread to 12 of the 13 east wing dorms. Everyone involved divided among racial lines. You have had problems out here in the past due to racial tension. What's going on? Well, we do have a large amount of inmates here on the facility, and uh, some of them don't want to go by the rules. They, uh, some of them instigate fights, and they escalate. More than 150 inmates were injured, injuries ranging from minor to serious. The most seriously hurt transported to area hospitals, while deputies were left trying to get the situation under control. Most of the people on overall want to get along and just do their time, get, get out, do it. But there's a few instigators who uh, insist on, on agitating. And we have to uh, isolate those as, as we identify. After we uh, can determine that these, uh, these disturbances will stop, they've all been quelled and things are calm, then we're we will conduct an investigation as to how this occurred and how we can prevent this from occurring again. Until then, the emergency operations center inside the jail will remain on alert. Everybody that comes in is checked, both citizens and deputy-wise, and just the facilities are on lockdown. There's no movement, no visiting. And a lockdown will remain in effect. No visiting, no inmate phone calls. Now, in addition to the disturbances today, there was also fighting out here early Tuesday morning. Eleven inmates were involved, seven were injured. There were also fights on January 6th. So now we are in the third week of the new year. It has gotten off to a violent start here at the detention center. I'm Tony Ginyard reporting live from Zongas. Back to you in the studio. Tony, do they blame overcrowding in any way for this, or is it uh, strictly written up as a racial issue? Uh, I have not heard the word overcrowding used tonight. I'm told that it does have something to do with racial tension here at the detention center. We've seen this before. We're just seeing an awful lot of it right now. They seem to feel there are a few instigators that they want to get their hands on, possibly transfer them from this facility. We'll just have to wait and see. Okay. Thank you. An 18-year-old from Burbank is in jail tonight, suspected of arranging her own mother's murder. Dixie Hollier was beaten, shot, and stabbed to death. Police say her daughter, Amber Bray, masterminded the plot. Our investigation revealed that the, the daughter and the male suspect, her boyfriend, had planned this murder in advance, that when the, the male suspect arrived uh, in the morning, that the daughter let him into the residence, knowing he was there to kill the mother. Police identify the boyfriend as Jeffrey Ayers. He and Bray are being held without bail at the Burbank Jail. Authorities say this murder was so brutal, they may seek the death penalty. The system we depend on in times of crisis is in crisis itself. Hundreds of thousands of people who dial 911 hang up in frustration when they can't reach an operator. All this after voters passed a huge bond issue to upgrade the system. Randy Page has a report on what's gone wrong. Do you need the police fire, This is the underground nerve center for the city's 911 system. Every day, the phones here ring nearly 7,000 times, 285 times an hour. It is the largest 911 system anywhere in the nation, and many experts say it is among the most antiquated. It became apparent that the 911 system here needed to be revamped when citizens needed it the most. After the riots in 1992, city voters approved a bond issue, which allocated more than $200 million to upgrade the system. But today, little has changed. In 1993, about 149,000 calls, or about 6%, went unanswered, sometimes because the caller was put on hold, got nervous, and hung up. Every year since, the number of unanswered calls has increased. And in 1995, nearly 200,000 calls, or about 13%, went unanswered. There's almost nothing when it comes to emergency services more critical than those first few seconds when a crisis happens. And you need to have somebody at the other end of that line. City Council Member Michael Fuhrer says it is unacceptable for nearly 200,000 callers to hang up before an operator is available to take their call. It's a striking statistic. And um, it, it leads us all to wonder what tragedies might have been averted if those calls had been answered in a timely way and really underscores the significance of revamping our 911 system now. Police sources cite several reasons for the unanswered calls. In some cases, callers hang up only to call right back and eventually get through. Also, many of the dispatchers here are new, so it takes longer to process the calls. 
As for changes promised by the $200 million bond approval, Police Commissioner Art Maddox says it takes years to put together a new state-of-the-art system that can serve the city in the decades to come. I feel confident that the people we have working on it are doing everything they can to move it forward as quickly as possible. In the meantime, callers continue to hang up. In fact, in the time it took to show this report, an average of 10 callers tried to dial 911, and chances are at least one of them gave up before getting through. Randy Page, KCAL 9 News. The city plans to add and upgrade some of the equipment, but a brand new system is still years away. Former LAPD Detective Mark Furman bragged about alleged misconduct in conversations with a screenwriter, but acted like a model officer on the witness stand. The question is, when was he really telling the truth? Tonight, the surprising results of an official investigation, and Frank Buckley joins us in the newsroom with more on that. Frank. David, the investigation was conducted by the Public Defender's Office. The head of the office wanted to know if any of Furman's past cases could be reopened because of alleged misconduct. Attorneys looked at some three dozen cases and found no grounds to reopen. Are you there Mark Furman told attorney F. Lee Bailey that he hadn't word used the N-word during the past ten years. Yes, that's what I'm saying. But he told a screenwriter on tape that he did engage in police misconduct. But a recent investigation found that at least since 1988, Furman did not appear to engage in misconduct. No evidence of racial bias, no planting of evidence, no falsification of evidence. If we did, I assure you, we would have reopened those cases. Michael Judge is the L.A. County Public Defender. He says his office looked at 35 cases in which Furman participated as an investigator before the O.J. Simpson case. Judge was trying to determine if any of his office's clients had been railroaded. Our focus was on whether our clients had unjustifiably been convicted. And in those cases that we did investigate, we found no evidence of misconduct by Mark Furman. Furman has said all along through attorneys and others that his words on tape were bravado, an attempt to impress a screenwriter. And his current attorney, Richard Town, told me that the public defender's investigation revealed what we would have expected. The tapes, he said, were fiction. But tonight in downtown Los Angeles, Simpson attorney Johnny Cochran expressed surprise. I haven't seen the report, but I think that we certainly unearthed an awful lot of that, you know, uh, from his own, out of his own mouth. And of course, uh, you now heard the jurors speak, and they didn't believe him from the very beginning. And uh, he did, as, as we knew, played a very central part in the case. The results of this probe are not expected to impact on others that continue, including the state attorney general's probe, into alleged perjury by Furman. Cochran questioned why the results have yet to be released. The district attorney's office has taken a long time, Frank, where they've sent it over to the attorney general's office. It's as though if you or I had done this, we get a decision right away. And so I think they should make a decision, whatever it is, quickly, that people have a right to expect that. Now, the public defender says his investigation of Furman revealed no incidents of police misconduct. In fact, in some cases, some of the defendants even complimented Furman for being so polite. David, back to you. All right. Thanks very much, Frank. Hardy? It's a case of back to the future for former Orange County Supervisor Gotti Vasquez. He began his career as a police officer, and tonight he says he'll return to the beat. Vasquez was the only supervisor to resign after the county's budget crisis. He's now a vice president at Southern California Edison, but will give up that job and the executive salary to become a patrol officer in the city of Orange. Still ahead on the 10 o'clock report, a pioneer of talk TV calls it quick. Plus, the nation is mourning the loss of a pioneer in politics. We will look back on the remarkable career of Congresswoman Barbara Jordan and former Duchess stripped of royal riches in the millions. Find out why Fergie's in the red. And bad information on your credit record does not have to be a fact of life. Our money man explains how to fix things up at 1055. One of the great voices in modern American politics is silent tonight. Former Congresswoman Barbara Jordan died today of pneumonia. She had been ill with leukemia and with multiple sclerosis. And tonight, the trailblazing politician is being remembered for her integrity, her intellect, and above all, her moving oratory. Barbara Jordan spoke with passion and conviction. 
never more so than when she served on the House Committee considering the impeachment of Richard Nixon. Now, I am not going to sit here and be an idle spectator to the diminution, the subversion, the destruction of the Constitution. Her story is unique in American politics. Raised in a poor Houston neighborhood, Jordan became the first black state senator in Texas history and in 1972 became the first Southern black since Reconstruction to be elected to Congress. Power, um, intelligence, courage, intensity, no nonsense, um, intellectual, uh, principle. I think all of those uh, words would apply to, uh, to Barbara. Her speeches electrified crowds at three Democratic national conventions, but her lofty principles earned Jordan the admiration of political foes as well. Barbara Jordan was a champion of our freedom, our Constitution, and our laws. I would gamble that if you would attempt to ask her what does it mean to you being a black American, that she'll find some way of telling you that she was just an American who happened to be black. Fellow Texan and former Senator Lloyd Benson said of Jordan, she would speak as though speaking from tablets of stone. Barbara Jordan was just 59 years old. In Washington, the budget battle rages on, the oratory not quite so eloquent. GOP congressional leaders called off today's budget talks with the president. Instead, they sent him a letter challenging him to come up with new proposals. The Republicans say the president's plan doesn't go far enough in cutting taxes, or reforming Medicare and welfare. But the White House says the president has been very flexible and says it doesn't seem to matter what he proposes, he gets nowhere. A lot of talk today about a complete overhaul of the U.S. tax code. Is a flat tax the answer? Some of the Republican presidential candidates think so. So who saves the most under a flat tax and who has the most to lose? Our political reporter Dave Bryan shows us how the numbers add up. Yeah. <laughs> During the next four months, most working citizens will come eyeball to eyeball with the nightmare of our capitalist economy, the American tax system. I'll crash it, because this is on behalf of the American taxpayers. Right? Yeah. Uh, Today in Washington, a Blue Ribbon Republican Tax Reform Commission said the current system should be scrapped and replaced with a single low tax rate for everyone, with generous personal exemptions to protect the poor and families, and deductions for Social Security and Medicare payroll taxes. In other words, a flat tax. A flatter, fairer, simpler. <laughs> a 17% tax plan is the centerpiece of publisher Steve Forbes' campaign. And when Forbes shot into second place in recent GOP polls, the flat tax took off with him. Now, Forbes never misses an opportunity to bash the current tax code. This monstrosity should be replaced with a simple flat tax. Under the current tax system, American rates range from a low of 15% all the way up to 39%. The flat tax would blow up that system and replace it with a single rate, say 17% for everyone. The ticking time bomb in the flat tax plan is the home mortgage interest deduction, the middle class tax break on which the American dream of home ownership is built. Under a pure flat tax plan, the deduction would be eliminated, but that could set off a political revolution. If the mortgage interest deduction is wiped out, middle-class families like the Winslows, who are heavily invested in their home, would lose a huge deduction and could actually pay more taxes. Once people investigate it, once they've read a couple things about it, um, at least for people in my position, it's going to uh, hurt them. There's also another side to fairness. Right now, some rich people may well be dodging in paying their fair share of income tax by some of the loopholes which a flat tax would get rid of. In fact, the flat tax may rise or fall on whether the American people think it's fair. In L.A., I'm Dave Bryan, KCAL 9 News. That Blue Ribbon Commission stopped short of recommending a specific flat tax rate. Seems as if everybody's on the Internet these days, so why not the IRS? The agency has a home page on the World Wide Web. So if you have tax questions, you can call them up on the Internet instead of trying to get through on that toll-free phone number. Got a pencil ready? Here's the internet address. It's on the World Wide Web, and here are the, here's the code you see right there on your screen. The IRS on the internet. Well, speaking of money, the Duchess of York is said to be in some trouble. She owes various creditors millions of dollars, and the Queen has apparently decided to give her some tough love instead of a bailout.
Palace official says the Duchess, Sarah Ferguson, is responsible for her own financial affairs. The Queen is believed to have helped out with other cash payments, but has indicated she will not provide any further financial assistance. The Duchess is reported to have received a multi-million dollar settlement from her ex-husband for the care of their daughters. She also receives an allowance from her ex-husband and income from the sale of her children's books. She's been criticized for having an extravagant lifestyle. And on the next Donahue show, Phil himself is calling it quits. Right, it's going to be the last season for his TV talk show. Industry analysts blame his departure on slipping ratings and a crowded talk show market. Donahue's been on the air since 1967. It began as a local interview show in Dayton, Ohio. He says that a studio audience showed up by mistake, so audience members were invited to watch and ask questions during the commercials. He said he liked that idea because their questions turned out to be better than his. And the half-sister of Newt Gingrich is back in the spotlight tonight. Candace Gingrich will appear on tomorrow night's episode of Friends, playing the part of a minister at a lesbian wedding. Gingrich, who's a lesbian in real life, has uh, frequently clashed with her famous half-brother because of her activism. Gingrich says that she is proud to take part in television's changing attitude toward gays and lesbians. And real-life drama tonight for Andy Griffith. Authorities say that his son was found dead today. A police officer says 38-year-old Sam Griffith was found dead by his roommate at their North Hollywood home. There was no indication of foul play. His father, of course, is best known for his hit show that ran for many years, as well as the series Matlock. Still ahead this evening, a teacher with a double life is fired for being a porno star. You'll see why some of his students, and even some of their parents, see nothing wrong with what he's done. And researchers discover a new tool in the fight against cancer that was right under their noses. We'll explain when the 10 o'clock report comes right back. It was a terrifying plot, and those convicted received harsh sentences today. Sheikh Omar Abdel Rahman and nine of his followers will spend a long time in prison for plotting to blow up various New York City landmarks. The militant Muslim cleric was handed a life sentence by a federal judge. The nine of the defendants received sentences ranging from life to 25 years behind bars. Today's sentencing came nearly two years after the convictions in the World Trade Center bombing. The people convicted today were not directly involved in that bombing, but were accused of being part of the group that carried it out. Dr. Jack Kevorkian may be coming to California to open an assisted suicide center. Kevorkian's attorney says his client has raised money for a network of such clinics and regards California as a prime location. Some think he's going to run into some big obstacles. Penal Code Section 401 makes it a felony to assist in a suicide. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind that he would not be able to get a business license. He certainly couldn't open up a clinic uh, of any kind because you've got not only state, but federal and, and local ordinances. Dr. Thomas supports the idea of death with dignity, but says he cannot support the clinic. A single bad gene may be responsible for breast cancer in young women, women in their 20s and 30s. The gene, called BRCA1, has been found in women with a family history of breast cancer, and now researchers are finding it in women with no family history of the disease. Researchers say the younger women are, the younger women are when they get their breast cancer, the more likely that it is caused by that particular gene. Well, using their keen sense of smell, dogs have helped their human masters perform a variety of tasks over the years, and now researchers are finding dogs may be able to sniff out cancer. One researcher found that in hundreds of searches, a dog could detect the cancer almost 100% of the time. Researchers believe the dog's detective work may lead to breakthroughs. What are they smelling? I mean, it's an intriguing question. What is the chemical that they're actually smelling? Maybe that finding out and elucidating that chemical would be quite helpful as a basic science question. The experts believe their dogs may be able to detect lung cancer in the future, they think it may be possible just to have patients breathe on a fabric and then put these dogs to work. Wow, amazing story. Yeah. The National Transportation Safety Board has started hearings on last year's collision between a train and a school bus near Chicago. Seven teenagers died of that accident. The train crashed into a bus that was stopped at a signal crossing. The back of the bus had not completely cleared the tracks. At the hearing today, the train engineer, an 18-year veteran, says he slammed on the brakes, sounded the whistle, and prayed. 
and I just kept whistling uh, uh, plumb up until uh, I hit the bus. I, I kept saying to myself, uh, God, please let it move. Please let it move. Federal investigators have focused on the light. They found it did not always turn green in time to give vehicles enough time to get across the track. It's a controversy that has captured some national attention. A high school teacher in Massachusetts who had a double life was fired today for making and appearing in porno movies and for allegedly asking a student to appear in an X-rated video. Uh, today, dozens of students who think he's a wonderful teacher skipped class to protest. The controversy has divided the town of Yarmouth on Cape Cod, and today the teacher's firing sparked a student demonstration. I think what he does in his own time is his business. Robert Bubba Walensky had spent 25 years at Dennis Yarmouth Regional High School. He's also produced and appeared in low-budget porno movies. And according to Superintendent Michael McCaffrey, he approached a student last year about appearing in a video. On Sunday, Walensky was suspended. Today, he was fired. McCaffrey calls the situation disappointing, sad, and puzzling. Today, we try to not overreact. But tomorrow we intend to enforce the disciplinary code. If students uh, leave class uh, when they're not supposed to, there will be suspensions. Some parents agree with the firing. I think he's 100% right. Why? Because I believe that teachers should be held to a high moral standard. But others believe the district is overreacting. Just leave them alone. They're making a big thing out of nothing. Today, the firing of Robert Bubba Walensky sparked a demonstration by the students who support him. Walensky is also getting support from his union. The Massachusetts Teachers Association says it will represent him if he asks for help. The state education commissioner in Massachusetts says he will move to revoke Walensky's license to teach. Walensky has three weeks to appeal. Now, two years after the Northridge earthquake, the financial aftershocks are still being felt. Just ahead, one family who lost their home in the quake, still struggling. Our Target 9 investigation is coming up next. She says fighting in an amateur boxing contest caused her son's death. But this boxing promoter denies it. Plus, Daryl Hannah's new movie has her walking the streets. Watch Inside Edition. Tomorrow night at 7 on KCAL 9. Indelible memories. Two years ago today, a monster struck, the Northridge earthquake, a magnitude 6.7 earthquake that woke us up at 4.31 a.m. and left a devastating mark. 72 people dead, more than 11,000 hurt, property damage, $25 billion. Perhaps one of the most haunting images of that day was the scene at the Northridge Meadows apartment complex. When the quake struck, most of the residents were asleep. Sixteen people died when the complex collapsed. It became the tragic symbol of the quake. Today, that rubble has been cleared away. Construction on a new complex called the Sophia Ridge Apartments is now underway. This morning, flowers were placed at the site in memory of those who died in the earthquake. Well, many homeowners thought that they were prepared for trouble with earthquake insurance, but they weren't prepared for the financial aftershocks. Long, involved fights with their insurance companies over coverage. Target 9's Bill Gephardt has their story. Wendy Moore has all new clothes. So does her husband, John, but buying new clothes was not their choice. Because it was contaminated. It was contaminated with asbestos fibers. The Northridge quake broke their furnace duct. The asbestos insulation around the duct leaked in. Then, when the blower came on, asbestos fibers floated all over all their belongings. Any material items that we had just being displaced, like, like moving to another state and not taking anything with you. The Moors hired an asbestos consultant who sealed off their home. Then they bagged up everything, furniture, appliances, clothes, everything, and threw it away before cleaning and ridding the house of asbestos fibers. The Moors say they began this process on the recommendation of their insurance company, 20th Century. Talking to our uh, insurance adjuster, they recommended we have it uh, tested for asbestos. And the asbestos analysis laboratories noted asbestos was found and occupancy cannot now be recommended. But after the expensive cleaning, 20th Century wrote it tested too. And 20th Century says it is quite clear that there are no asbestos fibers found in the air of the Moore's home. And now 20th Century refuses to pay the claim. It's not a fair denial. 
The Moors are now using lawyer Barry Fisher to sue 20th Century for their $80,000 expenses. So you had asbestos contamination as a direct result of the earthquake, and that's why it would be a covered claim. 20th Century Insurance, when we contacted them about this case, decided they didn't want to have any comment. Instead, they referred us to another company that has nothing to do with insurance. It's the public relations firm of Fleischman Hilliard, but there was no comment here either because the case is in court. But the Moore's case is not isolated. At Community Assisting Recovery Office, or CARE, they have more than 3,000 such cases. CARE was formed to help victims fight insurance companies. This volunteer is in charge of 20th century cases. She says the Moore's case is like many others. They allow the policyholder to insure the cost, and then they say we won't pay for it. And, and CARE's computer files show 20th century is only one of the many insurance companies in disputes with thousands of homeowners in the earthquake area. The executive director of CARE says there's a pattern with earthquake victims. This is a real strong statement, and, and I'm willing to defend it. But almost every, every um, claim that I've seen has been mishandled. And from that, I can say that uh, every claim has been mishandled. What about other people, you know? For the Moors, they are suing in court. But they want others to know what happened to them so others can fight their own insurance company. Bill Gephardt, KCAL 9 News. 20th Century has paid out millions of dollars in claims, and the insurance company claims to have a half-billion-dollar loss just because of the Northridge quake. Well, coming up next, trouble at 33,000 feet. You'll see why there were some very tense moments aboard a jet when the 10 o'clock report continues. Next on Springer. I used to, to turn my day. nose up to homeless people because I swore I'd never be like this. These women had it all and lost everything. It could happen to you. Next, Jerry Springer. Weeknights at 11 on KCAL 9. Intense moments aboard a TWA jetliner after a stairway drops down from a plane at 35,000 feet. Now, despite the trouble, the Boeing 727 did land safely. The plane was en route from St. Louis to San Antonio when the rear stairway popped open. A crew member tied a rope around himself to keep from being swept out as he pulled the hatch closed. Nobody was hurt, and TWA says the passengers were never in any danger. Ooh, certainly so, got your attention. Yeah, they won't forget that anytime <laughs> soon, that's for sure. Mm, no. How nice was it out there today? It was gorgeous today, don't you think? Visibility is wonderful. Yes. It was Great. very windy. Ten on a scale of ten today. But the uh, winds have died down. Yes. And we have a storm that is basically a twin of yesterday's storm coming in at a later time tomorrow, not during the evening commute like it was last night. Later on, much later, mostly during the overnight hours into early Friday. Same and amount of rain. Weekend. Same amount of rain, same hit and miss situation. Farther south you go, the lighter the rainfall figures. But it's an identical twin when it comes to the intensity and the path that it's taking. So expect a little bit of rain late tomorrow night, early Friday morning. Out of here for Friday, but windy on Friday, much like it was last night and into a good part of today. Let's head outside right now to Mammoth Mountain, show you some conditions that are just absolutely Fabulous. marvelous for the Sierra Nevada. Fabulous. Skiers, water supply, everything. Let it just keep snowing up there. We can do fine down here without it. Just build it up. As long as they keep sending us that water. That's right. Thank you very much, Sierra Nevada. Anyway, they had uh, 18 inches of new snow and more on the way there as well. And Mammoth has uh, got the best skiing in the entire Sierra Nevada. In fact, probably the best skiing in California right now. And that was not a paid commercial endorsement either. It's the truth. Might Clear skies. <laughs> no, no. Clear skies. Temperature 57 degrees. Humidity 70%. Wind northwest at 5 miles per hour. And the barometer is rising. High for the afternoon today, 71. Normal is 68 this time of year. And the record, 90 degrees. That was set back in 1971. Let's take a look at the nation's weather here very quickly because I want to show you our storm that passed by here last night is racing across into Texas. Warm, moist Gulf air coming in front of it. A lot of cold Arctic air coming down out of the north. You get these two air masses and all that moisture, you're going to get a lot of unstable air. And tonight it is triggering some thunderstorms, perhaps in the severe category, so severe that there's a tornado watch in effect right now. Yeah, it's January and we have tornado watches in effect across parts of the south. And that is mostly across Texas, on into Oklahoma, and on into portions of Arkansas, and from northeast uh, portions of Oklahoma, on into Arkansas tonight. We have an area of severe thunderstorms with a severe thunderstorm watch in effect there. Now, you get farther north in the system. In fact, let's just take away the clouds, and I'll show you what's happening right now. In terms of the um, radar and what it depicts, we can actually kind of just tear everything out of this picture. And I was hoping we could tear everything out. There it goes. 
Areas of red, green, indicating in yellow, the strong showers and thunderstorms in through here. You get into this area of red, and now it's an area of freezing rain, and then you get back into this area. This is all snow. They have snow from North and South Dakota on into Minnesota, just hitting parts of Northwestern Wisconsin. More snow down here across Kansas, on into Oklahoma, Texas, and into New Mexico. And all this is slowly heading to the east. By the way, the snow area, as much as, if you're ready for this, as much as 10 inches of snow possible across Wisconsin, the upper peninsula of Michigan, and on to the rest of the Great Lakes. Anyway, around here, we've got that incoming uh, area of cloudiness, and for late tomorrow night, on into early Friday, a little bit of shower activity. But again, tomorrow, a portion, a good portion, a good, the entire day, in fact, dry. Tomorrow night, late, and you're ready to, oh, about this time tomorrow night, maybe Santa Barbara, Ventura County will be getting it. Then you'll go to sleep for the sound of rain. Wake up Friday. It should be pretty much almost out of here by Friday morning, and then uh, more on Saturday night, Sunday. Can I borrow your free pass, the Mammoth? <laughs> we can talk about that later. All right, thanks. It's a season pass. My picture's right. on it, but we look it up alike. <laughs> In that vein, you may be able to ride a bull, but I'll tell you, these guys don't stand a chance on snow. A rodeo you won't want to miss. Also, up. yes, the mighty ducks get burned by the flames. Gary Cruz coming up next with sports. So they call them the flames because fire's hot. And they're hot. Yeah, somebody got burned. And that might That's be... True. And I'm burned, yeah. yeah. A certain team in a certain city. Right. Calgary's had a nice day in Southern California the past couple of days. Last night, they tied the Kings. Tonight, they had a 2-0 lead when Paul Correa ripped a rocket at Trevor Kidd. The Ducks get a lucky bounce here. Then David Sacco hits the open net. Now, does this look like a happy man? No. So, Tron Wilson isn't because... His team never got back into the game as Troy Stillman did Guy Hebert scored with 48 seconds left in the first period. Calgary wins it 4-1. to one. Theron Fleury had one goal tonight, four in his last two games. Guy Hebert pulled. Yes, he was pulled after the first period. Now, battle of two first-place Cubs as Colorado's Patrick Wall makes a kick save and then an amazing glove save under Troy Vyaslav Fedosov right there. Now, as great as Wall looked in the first sequence, he looked awful, dreadful in this. It's Sergei Fedorov fake. Patrick fell. Sergei hits the game winner. Colorado wins it. I should say loses it 3-2. to two. Well, Ottawa opened a new building tonight, and they were shut out in their new building by Justin Thibault. Uh, it was uh, Hartford over the Islanders. San Jose, Winnipeg also win. Tom Barrasso, 31 saves to shut out Buffalo. Washington down Chicago and Edmonton 4, Dallas 3. Well, headlining the NBA schedule, a couple of former Clippers came to town tonight to try and beat up on their old buddies. But first... If the fans didn't like the game, Dave, they had to love the halftime show. The boys are awesome. Former Clipper Char Smith greets Clippers young star Brent Berry with a block. And then Brian Williams continues to be a very bright spot for L.A. as he will dunk on Smith. Come on, boys. I think you need to take a break. Fellas, chill out. Patrick Ewing, by the way, helped the Knicks maintain this lead as his jumper is underrated. He knocked it down right there. And the New Yorkers hit some big, big shots late as Derek Harper's bomb is good from beyond the line. And can you believe it? The boys are still at it. Fellas, call it a night. Yeah, they're awesome. They're still there. 92-81 New York with that game. In other action, Cotton Fitzsimmons' first game back as the Phoenix coach was a tall order. Now, to get through Orlando, you have to get through Shaq. That doesn't happen often as the big fella dominated tonight. He and Penny Hardaway know each other so well that alley-oops are a piece of cake. O'Neal scored 38. Meanwhile, in Denver, the Houston Rockets beat the Nuggets but suffered a big, big loss from super sudden Mario Ely busted his right wrist on that ball. Meanwhile, in Miami, Bimbo Coles just lost it and went nuts and he went after Juwan Howard. Mutt and Jeff then threw punches. Both benches empty. And you know fines and or suspensions are up for the next several... Uh, I should say, in the several days for several Bullets and Miami Heat players. Wow. By the way, Alonzo Mourning for Miami had 38-15 rebounds. Miami did beat Washington. Atlanta, New Jersey also won tonight. Boy, the big dog, Glenn Robinson, 37 points for Milwaukee in their win. I hear Isaiah Ryder, 31 in Minnesota's victory over Golden State. Orlando, of course, beat Phoenix. And Mario Ely is out eight weeks with that broken wrist in that win over Denver. Well, there's a big day at the big league meetings in downtown L.A. tomorrow. The owners are expected to approve interleague play, which would begin in 1997. The owners are also expected to approve the sale of a minority interest of the Angels to the Disney Corporation. Now, done under Andre Agassi protected his bald noggin from the Melbourne Australian Sun 
and played a rare serve and volley point against Vincent Spadia. Now he puts away the backhand touch volley. That was pretty. Grace Forte, though, is ripping shots from the baseline. And when he wasn't being fined 1500 bucks for obscenities, can't tell you what he said, he was slamming clean winners. Agassi rolled in straight sets. And tonight, Cruiser's ticker takes you to Steamboat Springs, Colorado for a unique skiing event. Grab the kids, it's the annual National Western Rodeo and Stock Show Cowboy Downhill. Nine out of ten of these rodeo stars ski about once a year at this event. The other one doesn't ski at all. A few of them get from the top to the bottom without crashing, but this is small potatoes compared to riding a 2,000-pound bull or a bucking bronco. These guys are nuts. I have been up there for that. I have actually covered that event, and I got miles away, by the way, to save my <laughs> Stay skin. Out of way. But these guys are unbelievable. They have a lot of fun, and believe it or not, they never get hurt. They're tough. They know how to fall. They're used to falling. That's, that's, that's what they do. They take the spurs off of that. They Sometimes they don't. Oh, okay. No. They are wild guys. Crazy. And I think they have a little bubbly before they get on those skis. Yeah. I would guess that's a pretty good party in Steamboat. <laughs> oh, it's a great party. Okay. Thanks, Gary. Yes. Yeah. Still ahead. If you have a negative credit record, not to worry. Our money man can help you out by showing you how to turn a negative into something positive. One of the biggest problems for home buyers is having a credit history with negative information. But maybe that information doesn't belong to you in the first place. In tonight's financial planner, Money Man Alan Mendelson tells us how you can get your credit history fixed. The mortgage business is so competitive these days, mortgage companies are bending their rules to make deals. Are you a first-time buyer? Countrywide, the giant mortgage company has even started a counseling center to give buyers information and to help them qualify for a loan. For example, if a borrower doesn't have a credit history, the loan counselors can tell them how to create one for the loan application. So we can help them establish credit through utility bill payments, through landlord receipts. There's ways to establish good credit and show that this person is willing and able to pay back a loan. But a bigger problem is a bad credit history. If the bad information is a mistake, Countrywide has a free manual that can help you clear errors. What's really helpful about this manual is that it gives you sample letters. Sample letters you can use to write to the credit reporting agencies. You know, TRW and those other companies. Just find the sample letter that addresses your problem, copy it, and mail it to TransUnion, Equifax, and TRW. The addresses are given. Frequently what happens is they get confused with other borrowers with similar last names or similar names. And so we can help them clear up those accounts that aren't, aren't actually theirs. We give them a step-by-step -step process as to how to talk to the credit agencies and each one of the, uh, the credit providers to make sure that they aren't being confused with somebody else. Another common problem is divorce. If some previous debts are assigned to your ex but show up on your credit report, the counselors can tell you what to do. Countrywide has free booklets and free videos that can help you understand the home buying process. To get the free manual, your credit and you, call Countrywide's House America unit at 800 Five seven seven three seven three two. Again, eight hundred five seven seven three seven three two. You've probably heard that a bankruptcy will stay on your credit report for at least seven years, maybe ten years. But a bankruptcy doesn't have to knock you out of the housing market. We're looking at those more flexibly. Many lenders are in fact willing to give mortgages two years after a bankruptcy, providing you have maintained good credit since the bankruptcy and have demonstrated an ability to save. We normally look for up to two years of good credit since that bankruptcy before we want to uh, encourage them to buy a house. Not seven years? No, seven years is not required. Seven years would, would eliminate it totally from their credit report. But uh, you'll actually give a mortgage to someone after two years? Yes. Now here's the bottom line for your money. I'll send you a free summary of this financial planner with the names and phone numbers of the professionals that can help you. Send a self-addressed stamped envelope to Financial Planner, KCAL 9 News, P.O. Box 38130, Hollywood 90038. One stamp is all you need. That's your money. Alan Mendelson, KCAL 9 News. And tomorrow night, our financial planner continues with a look at the new mortgage plans that make home buying easier. And that's all the time we have tonight, I think. <laughs> Thanks for joining us at 10 o'clock. But don't forget KCAL 9 News tomorrow at noon and again at 3 o'clock. For Pat Harvey, I'm R.D. Saul. Good night. I'm David Jackson for... All of us.
Good night. The crew. Good night. The crew. Los Angeles, Carlos Ryan.